David for the invitation to talk. Uh, I'm excited to um, chat with you all. Just forewarning, I talk pretty quickly and I have so much to share with you. So I might kind of gloss over some things just in the interest of um, leaving some time at the end to talk. So um, as Andrea mentioned, this is co-sponsored by the Society for Digital Mental Health. I also happen to be the co-chair of the Health Equity SIG um, at the Society for Digital Mental Health with my colleague, who's probably on the call, Ashley Knapp. So I encourage you to check out SDMH uh, and join our uh, SIG, where we have more fun conversations, or hoping to have more fun conversations like this. So, um, so although my talk is going to be focused on LGBTQ adolescents and um, digital HIV prevention and sexual health um, research that I have done, I think that um, you know this is more of a methods talk and more of how we have engaged teenagers throughout different kinds of research um, in different ways. And so even if you don't work specifically with LGBTQ teens or do um, prevention work, um, you know, I think that a lot, of, or I'm hoping that a lot of the things that I'll be sharing today will be relevant for you. So let's jump in. So I'll give you a quick overview on LGBT teens' health and well-being um, and their use of technology and social media, and really hope to spend most of the time talking about um, three case examples of how um, we've centered LGBT teens um, using a variety of different methods. So first I'll talk about how we've used Discord um, to do a youth advisory council and some um, human-centered design for a text message-based HIV prevention intervention that I'm running right now. Um, how we've used teen input um, and experiences to develop um, basically an online dating safety um, uh, simulator. Uh, and then using different types of in-person and virtual youth engagement to develop a multimedia HIV prevention campaign. So younger generations are increasingly identifying as LGBT, as you might uh, have heard in the news. So this, um, this uh, graphic is from Gallup showing that um, in uh, Gen Z compared to previous generations, um, only or one in five people in Gen Z identifies as LGBT. Um, and uh, emerging data from um, a longitudinal cohort study in the US called the ABCD cohort study suggests that Gen Alpha, who comes after Gen Z, so folks who were born um, in the uh, early 2010s to mid 2020s, um, might self identify as LGBT at even higher rates. And this is attributed to more accepting social norms, increased visibility and representation in the media. And you know, the internet really facilitates access to language to be able to, for folks to be able to um, express themselves and identify and, and kind of learn to uh, describe what their experiences are like. And with that, we've been doing, uh, we're seeing a lot more research on LGBTQ teens in the last um, decade and a half or so. And what we're finding is the epidemiological data show that LGBTQ teens experience a number of health inequities basically across the board compared to their cisgender and heterosexual teens. I've just listed a lot of them here. I'm not gonna go into it in more detail. Um, um, and this is all attributed to their, um, not because they're, this is all not because of their LGBT identity, but because of the lack of social safety, structural supports um, that protect LGBTQ folks um, and minority stress. And we know so much about the disparities that LGBTQ folks and teens specifically experience, but unfortunately this knowledge really has not been translated to interventions quickly enough. And a focus on LGBT teens' health and well-being is really needed now more than ever. If you've been paying attention to the news in the last year or two, you'll notice, or you might have noticed that um, um, there have been uh, tons and tons of anti-LGBTQ bills in the U.S. across the country here. This ACLU tracker um, that I screen grabbed this past week showed um, nearly 400. Um, last year, I think by the end of the year, there were probably 400 or 500 something. So it just keeps climbing up there. And a lot of these anti-LGBTQ bills focus on teens, um, sex education, gender affirming care, um, and things like that. And this really alarming study by the Trevor Project recently found that um, nearly 40% of LGBTQ youth don't expect to be alive by the age of 35, and that is just unacceptable. So online spaces and technology really offer us this direct way to access teens with interventions that can support their health and development. Um, and we know from tons of research that teens, um, things that teens do in person or that went 
when I was a teenager back in the 90s, things that we all did in person now also happen online and that the lines between um, in-person and, and offline life are just, um, or in-person and online life are just blurring. So, and this happens regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity, um, ranging from seeking support, making friends, finding um, romantic relationships and nurturing them, exploring who you are um, and seeking health information. And research shows that teens um, with minoritized or marginalized identities, so not just LGBTQ teens, but teens of color, teens with disabilities, teens with health conditions that are um, uh, often stigmatized, are more likely to engage in a lot of these behaviors online. So for LGBTQ teens in particular, um, technology and online spaces can be this lifeline for social support and health information. Um, they probably don't get in school um, much, if at all. Um, and thus kind of poses this really natural way for us to directly reach them with interventions that are not mediated by parents, um, educators, or healthcare providers. Um, and so my whole belief is that these, um, I came to Northwestern to uh, do work in digital health with LGBTQ young people. And I really believe that these interventions can make a big impact on teens health if it's done with care. So um, if you're a researcher in the audience, um, um, you probably are aware that a lot of the interventions that we develop kind of end up in this graveyard, um, this digital health graveyard in part because a lot of us were not trained to think about where it's gonna end up and who it's gonna be for up front. A lot of us kind of went into this field wanting to be scientists and develop apps and things like that. Um, but fortunately, this, uh, this tide is kind of changing or the sentiment is sort of changing where a lot of us are starting to think about implementation, dissemination, and who this is for up front. So over the last decade, um, I've uh, learned about these principles and sort of approaches that are in um, this diagram to the right, which really inform my work. So rapid, responsive, and relevant dissemination and implementation. So doing it faster and making sure, doing it faster, but doing it well, um, and making sure that it really gets the people who need it. Um, Human-centered design, um, which, you know, sort of translates into being empathic and curious about your population's needs and preferences and kind of iterating on your product until you come up with something um, that makes sense for them. Um, youth and community-based participatory research, so being youth-centered and involving teens wherever and as much as possible. Um, and then following ethical practices in adolescent health research, so doing what's best for youth and teens, even if it might be harder on you as a researcher. So with that sort of setting the stage, I wanted to spend really the rest of the time talking about how we have um, really centered teens and maximized their engagement um, in the digital health research process. Um, and I'm presenting some of these things because, um, and not specific research results, because honestly, um, this is what I get asked about the most, is how you actually get teens to buy into and participate in your research, um, and um, and how, you know, you make it so acceptable for them. So um, I'll talk about um, our use of Discord. Uh, back around the time that I started at Northwestern, so like 2013 or 2014, um, we had an in-person youth advisory council, and we started this closed Facebook group uh, back when Facebook was like really one of the Facebook and Instagram were really like some of the only social media platforms that were really widely used um, to facilitate engagement between meetings with our in-person youth advisors. And um, we continued to sort of dabble in using Facebook um, as our online uh, youth advisory um, um, council platform um, uh, with our in-person group and then as part of other studies. So um, the screenshot here is when we were developing a digital sex ed intervention, um, like from 2016 to 2020, we had started this new closed Facebook group for this nationwide youth advisory council for um, LGBTQ teens of color to kind of see if, um, you know, how, um, so for example, this screenshot is asking about recruitment and advertising um, specific to um, Native American teens. So what concerns or hesitations would they have about clicking on these ads? You know, what should organizations, um, you know, that provide services and programs, keep in mind when trying to recruit two-spirit, gay, bi, or queer Native teens, et cetera. 
So, um, and those are just kind of some down at the bottom example um, responses that people had um, and sort of, sort of to give you a sense for how it looked. Um, but then, you know, we just kept hearing like nobody uses Facebook anymore. That's like how I interact with my grandma or my aunt or something like that. So after getting a lot of youth feedback that people are just not using it anymore, um, a couple of years ago, we pivoted to using Discord. So um, and Discord was a thing that like our team didn't really use and, and even like the young adults in the team didn't really use. So we really just had to, you know, again, meet teens where they are and, and figure it out so that we could, um, you know, we could make things relevant for them. So right now, um, I have been using Discord for um, the last year for um, this Nationwide Youth Advisory Council, I might refer to them as YAC, in the context of an effectiveness and implementation study of um, this text message-based intervention intended to promote teens' um, engagement in HIV testing and sexual health care. So um, back in March of last year, we recruited 20 LGBTQ teens online, and we've engaged with them weekly since then. Um, and they've provided input really on like every stage of the um, every stage of the process. So adapting intervention content, um, software development, uh, advertising, recruitment, uh, you name it. And um, um, we there are a lot of um, kind of logistical considerations and in involving adolescents and research that I am um, uh, happy to talk about if you like at some point. Um, but one way, um, so one, we waived parental, per all the studies I'm talking about have waived parental permission um, for, for adolescent participants. And here, um, this is an IRB approved sub-study within our larger uh, intervention study protocol, which really helps facilitate payment. It's much easier to pay teenagers as research participants than it is to pay them as like independent contractors and have them fill out work, fill out paperwork to be an independent contractor and that sort of thing for the university. And it also facilitates our ability to cl collect data from, um, from these youth if we want. So participants um, engage in three month sessions. Um, we get them to agree to like three months at a time, just so it's, you know, sort of um, uh, not overwhelming for them and kind of gives them a chance to like opt out sort of at natural points. Um, our YAC is moderated by two research assistants. People can renew their participation um, for up to 12 months um, and they get paid up to 600 US dollars a year, which is just under the threshold um, where they have to pay taxes on it. And I will kind of show you how this looks. So, so the screenshot is um, uh, one of our planning spreadsheets. So one of my research assistants, Juliana Lorenzo, just like took this and ran um, and uh, planned out three months of Youth Advisory Council content at a time. So it's managed in Excel. As you can see here, there's kind of like a week at a glance in terms of um, what topics are going to be um, posted about each day, whether there are activities that are due or prompts that we have for them. Um, and as you can see, there is kind of a combination of research related stuff. So we're talking about mental health and bullying, vaccine conspiracies, asking for website feedback, but we're also doing fun stuff. Like there was a poll on Halloween about what, what people were dressing up as. Um, we wanted to get their input on what kind of swag and prizes they wanted for participating in our YAC. Um, and then we also had an opportunity to, um, we use this as an opportunity to give them some professional development. Like how do you write about your involvement in this advisory council on your resume or your college applications and things like that. Um, this is another example of how we use the spreadsheet to manage and organize our content. So um, we have um, the date and time of when it's supposed to be posted. Um, um, you know, kind of notes for the team about like how to post it. Is it going to be sort of a general post or posted in a thread? Um, and then the actual content that's posted on Discord, including formatting, emojis, et cetera. So this content is specifically about asking about, you know, what are some topics that we should include in our program when it comes to mental health and bullying for LGBTQ teens? What is stuff that you feel like is missing from existing interventions and things like that? So I have showed you how we sort of, you know, manage it on the back end, but I'll show you what it looks like um, on Discord. So uh, this is what teens see or what, uh, you know, the research team sees when they actually log in to um, the Youth Advisory Council. Um, right here, you see that there's kind of a chunk of information. We have, you know, kind of ground rules, information about the study, a link to the consent form, um, any kind of announcements like 
Northwestern is going to be on winter recess this week. Don't expect to hear from us. Um, and there's a chunk of activities. And this is sort of the bulk of what we do with them. Um, we uh, post our weekly questions in this general um, thread or in this general channel. Um, we'll do, I'll show you um, how we did Wizard of Oz testing with um, these youth in the texting channel. There are ways where teens can um, talk directly to us or ask us questions about a variety of things and ask the team. Um, there are opportunities to get paid extra um, for um, other activities, or um, there are opportunities to get paid for additional activities like um, coming up with um, Instagram ads for our recruitment or um, coming up with like a name or a mascot or things like that. Um, so, so they get to do um, kind of extra things for fun. We have closed um, channels for research staff, and then we also have a variety of resources for people. Um, and this is really an iterative process. Um, we have evolved the way that we do this over time based on teams' feedback. So one example of this is that um, we posted questions in the general section just about, I don't know, like content or something. Like we wanted to know what they wanted, um, what information would be helpful about substance use that like wasn't trite and stuff that they hadn't heard before. And then, you know, like as conversations go, they sort of started talking about other things that were personal and sort of not related to the research project. And they kept doing this over and over and over. And so in the team, we were like, well, maybe we should just create like, like a, you know, talk amongst yourselves sort of channel. So we created um, these uh, kind of um, this bate papa, which I believe means um, uh, chit chat in like Portuguese or something, um, which is where we're like, okay, you're like getting off the rails, like go take your conversation over there. So, um, and, and it, it's been received pretty well because, you know, it's, uh, I think they recognize that we're kind of giving them, um, you know, the space to like be themselves um, and, and be in a space that is like not constantly monitored by adults, but we do have a bot kind of running in the background just to sort of um, pick up on certain words that, uh, you know, uh, we might want to follow up it, follow up with. So it's not just a research space, but it's also kind of a social um, a social space space for them. And we um, have been able to use this um, to get feedback on not only this one study that I mentioned, but three other two um, screenshot, um, um, screenshot stuff, and then kind of mark it up and then submit it in our Discord server um, and kind of explain, you know, what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, was the spacing of um, the texts okay? Did you want to get them like all at once, or did you want to get some in the morning and in the evening, or like you know, sort of like commenting on the user experience? So um, after each week of testing was done, we used polls on Discord to elicit feedback um, on these things with emoji response options for fun uh, and to easily see the responses. So as you can see here, um, we say we're already making some of the changes you all suggested. Um, poll number one, the length of each text was too short, about right, too long. And you see like fruit of different sizes kind of corresponding to um, corresponding to the answer. And you can see here that you know, it's pretty easy to see people said about right. Poll number two was now that I've tested it, receiving eight to 10 texts in a day is not enough, fine or overwhelming. You can see that most people picked, I think the sandwich, which was fine. Um, and then we also gave them an opportunity to um, kind of weigh in uh, with open-ended comments about you know, different types of messages. Um, I had mentioned that this Youth Advisory Council um, has opportunities for um, us to give back and for teens to contribute. So um, this is one example of a resource that uh, our team came up with. And like, none of this is my idea. This is all of my staff's idea. So I really want to credit them with, uh, with coming up with it. But um, uh, there's a lot of conversation in the Youth Advisory Council about college and like we work in Northwestern and what's that like and what's it like to work here and what's it like to be a researcher and all of that stuff. And um, our team came up with a guide about how to include this on college applications or how to talk about this um, on resumes. 
um, in a way that, um, you know, is comprehensive. And then also for teens who don't want to disclose their LGBTQ identity, um, you know, in a way that still describes what the substance of what they did without alluding to their identity. Um, this is another example here um, of a teen who I believe they designed this um, Instagram ad and saw it, uh, um, saw it on our Teen Health Lab account um, and was posting about how they were so proud and this other participant said that, you know, they wanted to see it in the wild. So I think it's been a really cool opportunity um, for uh, to engage with teens really meaningfully. Um, and I mean, we literally do this like every every week. Um, this is some feedback from my team um, about, you know, kind of things, uh, things to consider or things that we've been thinking about. Um, this Youth Advisory Council approach has been super fruitful, and we plan to continue asking them questions because there's like constantly stuff that we want to ask. Um, anytime we have a meeting and um, there's like, we're like, what would teens do? We're like, we don't know, we don't know X about how teens interact. There's really just this kind of dedicated space for us to to, to ask people that. Um, but we're kind of thinking, you know, at what point should this group be refreshed or discontinued? Um, um, because, you know, certain groups of people might think a certain way um, and, uh, you know, we want to account for, um, you know, diversity of experiences. There are certain ethical issues that pop up every once in a while. Um, you know, we're always thinking about how we balance providing a space for teens to kind of be themselves and chat, um, but still, you know, kind of, thinking about what the point of the study is and thinking about, you know, is this something we need to report? Do we need to intervene with this, um, this particular issue or not? And then there are data complexities. Discord is not really meant, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I know there's a Discord academic research community, but it's not, I don't think it's really meant to be, um, it wasn't quite designed to be like a data collection tool. So um, we haven't quite figured out the best way to export data um, from, from Discord. Um, or or um, formatting it for analysis is kind of a mess, but uh, you know all things that we're trying to like work through. So that was um, case example number one. Um, number two is how we've used exploratory research and team input um, to guide this educational tool um, about dating app safety. Uh, so back in like. 2016 or 2017, a few of us on our team were working on updating the sex ed program for gay and bi teen boys that was originally developed, I think like in the mid 2000s or so. Um, and this was like 2016 or 2017. And um, back in 20, 2009 was when um, the, uh, the, the app grinder came out. So we were thinking, like, are teens on these apps? Like, should we include information on this? Um, do they know about Grindr? Um, so instead of making assumptions, we snuck in a few questions into an existing survey that I was, um, an existing online survey um, of a few hundred teens that I was managing. Um, and we asked, you know, have you heard of this? Have you heard of these apps? Um, are you using them? Where have you heard of them? What are you using them for? Are you meeting partners off of them? Are you having sex with those partners, et cetera? And, you know, in short, um, a lot of these teens had heard, nearly all the teens, I think maybe like one person said that they heard, heard of it, but um, nearly all the teens had heard of it. Um, and probably like half had met um, a partner on, um, on uh, online at the time. Um, and we've done some research since then that's, that's actually suggested it's more than that. Um, and when we asked them what their experiences were on these apps, um, it was really mixed. A lot of it was not positive. Um, they felt sort of um, um, singled out because of their age. They felt like unprepared to um, um, they kind of felt unprepared for the environment, um, and they also felt like there wasn't really anybody they could turn to to ask about this because they're adult apps. They didn't want to talk to their parents about them. It's not covered in sex ed. It's not covered even in LGBT-focused sex ed, so they kind of just had to like figure it out on their own, and these are some of the papers and some of the um, media um, coverage um, of some of this work that I've done. So, um, so 
we were learning about all this and used this information um, to develop an interactive educational tool, which we call Humper, um, uh, a play on Grinder. if you didn't get that already, um, to help teens navigate online sexual spaces um, kind of more safely. Let me see if I can play this. I'm not sure if it is. Oh, there we go. So um, Humper is one of a number of different activities in um, this online sex ed program we developed um, called SMART, and it's for gay boy and queer teen boys. You can learn more at that link. Um, and uh, um, although this was not, or, or Humper was not like the purpose of SMART. SMART, SMART was sort of this like uh, comprehensive sex ed program. And this was literally like a two minute long activity in here. And as you can see um, in this animation, um, you know, somebody is um, putting together um, their profile. Um, when they hover over the little information bubbles, it tells them what things mean. Um, I'll kind of skip ahead once they're done with their profile. Um, they get the opportunity to, oh, this is not working super well, but basically they get the opportunity to click around the app as if it was, you know, a dating app. And each of these information bubbles explains what this means. So what does PNP mean? What does top mean? What does they say their negative mean? What, what do all these acronyms mean that you might see um, on a dating app? And at the end of the activity, we have some like things to consider. So like if you are going to be using these apps or if you're gonna be exploring these apps, here are some things to keep in mind regarding HIV prevention, sexual health, substance use, keeping yourself safe. Um, and we asked participants who did this um, about what they thought. So they engaged in this activity and then right afterwards, we had them give it sort of a star rating um, or sorry, a thumbs up or thumbs down rating and explain what they thought of it. And we published some data recently showing that among um, 500 teens who, uh, who um, used this app in the context of our um, sex ed intervention, um, that it was really acceptable. They didn't, I wouldn't say that they like, found it super enjoyable, but they really appreciated the fact that it existed. So um, this participant said, I like how you acknowledge that guys will be using those apps instead of just completely ignoring it. Um, we also got some good critical feedback from teens. Um, some of them were like, you know, I, I wasn't sure whether, it wasn't entirely clear to me that it was a, um, that it was like, um, not a real app, <laughs> and, and it would have been nice to be able to skip it. Um, so they gave us some really useful sort of feedback on how to improve the user interface, design, um, content going forward. And we found that exposure to this activity um, was associated with greater odds of um, enacting online dating safety practices um, compared to teens who hadn't seen it um, several months later. Um, and more recently, um, a postdoc I work with, Jake Gordon, is doing interviews with the original um, teens who we had asked about, you know, have you ever heard of Grindr? Have you used it, et cetera? So this is like, you know, five or six, five or six years later, um, and is interviewing them about their dating app practices and showing them this tool, Humper, that we came up with and asking them about their feedback on it and you know, what they would improve now that they are a young adult who has been in sort of the dating app world for a while and what they would want to see. Um, so this one participant said, I wish I had learned about dating apps before I use them. It sucks to learn about them amidst all the chaos and harassment on dating apps. Um, and we've since extended um, some of our data collection to understanding what, um, uh, what uh, LGBT adolescent girls and trans feminine teens experience online and with online dating because we're very aware that um, gender and gender presentation might um, moderate these teens' experiences with online dating and partnering. Um, and this quote is from a trans feminine teen who says, a lot of us are not ever told about this. We figure it out ourselves. This can lead us to being manipulated a lot. So um, I'm hoping that we can iterate and expand upon this tool to be more comprehensive and gender inclusive in the future. So my final case example um, is involving teens in um, a rapid, responsive, relevant implementation of a multimedia HIV prevention campaign called Prep for Teens. 
So um, prep routines is uh, based on, or it's, um, it's sort of the child of a social marketing campaign called Prep for Love. So Prep for Love um, was a Chicago-based campaign um, that was launched about 2016 um, to decrease stigma um, around HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a highly, highly effective HIV prevention medication. Um, it's most commonly taken as a once daily pill. If you take it as prescribed, it's like 99% effective against sexually, sexually transmitted um, HIV, um, like 70 something percent effective against um, injection drug use um, or uh, HIV transmitted through um, needle sharing. Um, and it was, uh, the original campaign was focused on adults. And um, PrEP was FDA approved um, for young people under the age of 18. The, the indication is actually for um, people weighing at least 77 pounds, but it really was not prescribed to teens um, before 2018. So we what we really wanted to do was raise awareness of PrEP. I had done some research showing that um, teenagers were kind of aware of PrEP, but they thought it was like for adults, um, or they thought that, you know, something they had to get their parents permission for and things like that. So there are a lot of misconceptions out there about who PrEP was for um, um, and whether teens could access it. So we wanted to know whether um, a social marketing campaign could overcome, again, sort of um, access issues to information. Um, um, it wasn't really being talked about in sex ed, et cetera. So can we do a campaign and sort of reach more people that way? Um, so back in 2021, we did some asynchronous online focus groups um, with uh, Chicago area LGBTQ teens. Um, we did a design your own campaign activity as part of those focus groups, which I'll show, which I'll show you in a second, and did a few other um, sort of ways where we involved teens in co-design workshops, getting feedback um, from other youth um, on um, campaign concepts, and then actually involving youth um, um, to kind of participate in the uh, like launch of the campaign and maintenance of the campaign. So in the focus groups, we asked essentially what should a prep campaign um, contain and look like? And what we found is that teens really wanted digital delivery first, really no surprise there. So they had suggested a website, social media, and a Discord server, um, but not to ignore the value of um, kind of physical and in-person campaign assets. So, um, you know, since this was a Chicago area campaign, they were like, Chicago is a city of murals. You should have murals associated with the campaign. Um, people could take selfies in front of them. You could have info about um, prep or the website there. Um, um, they really wanted stickers. Um, everybody loves a good sticker to put on your water bottle or phone or laptop. And then events that were um, kind of inclusive of LGBTQ teens. Um, they wanted us, they wanted all the materials to convey um, autonomy, empowerment, authenticity, and inclusivity of all teens. So originally we had imagined this being for LGBTQ teens, but they were like, no, my, you know, my straight cisgender sister could benefit from learning about PrEP. Everybody should know about PrEP. If they know about birth control, they should know about PrEP. Um, and they also wanted it to be clear that teens were included in the whole development process because they felt like it would not be trustworthy if it looked like it was coming, if it was too polished, if it was too, um, if it looked like it was coming from a pharma company or something like that. And they really wanted just basic information, like what is PrEP, who is it for, where can I get it, um, do my parents need to know? So um, as I'm talking about this, I um, have a kind of call out to our um, Instagram and TikTok and our website down there at the very bottom if you want to poke around those while I'm talking about this. Um, I mentioned we had a design your own campaign activity. At the very end of the focus groups, basically we were like, okay, we've talked to you a lot about prep campaigns and gotten like, you know, gotten like a data dump from you about what you want to see out of them, what they should look like. Um, but we want to know what you think <laughs> they should look like um, instead of us sort of us adults taking this information and then hiring somebody out to sort of interpret from this research data what a prep campaign should kind of look like. 
And I really, um, I wasn't sure how this was going to land with teens, but we really liked the idea of giving teens the creative license to interpret the activity how they wanted um, and promoted, you know, it obviously promotes youth engagement in the design process. So we kind of let them go. We gave them a few days and said, upload your designs um, onto um, the online forum that we were doing the focus groups on or email them to us if you can't upload them. Um, and we had a variety of people interpret it in, in different ways. So um, these were two that I really like. So this is one example of um, um, one teen's interpretation of what like an Instagram or a TikTok ad would look like. Um, and it's formatted for an Instagram story. So it says that prep is for everyone. It kind of gets the message across. Um, it takes a pill a day or a shot every month to stay safe. It can be taken of any, it can taken, uh, be taken um, uh, of people of any age, gender, and sexual orientation. Um, it kind of has these like teen friendly, like, you know, images, a hashtag, you know, and it points to like more information. Um, and a lot of people sort of Instagram or TikTok formatted um, content was um, kind of similar to this. Um, and this one, I think, was one of the more innovative ones where a teen um, who actually ended up being um, a screenwriting major in college um, wrote a script for a hypothetical commercial um, that if you are of the age to remember like the Trojan man ads in the 90s is very much like that, um, but focused on prep. So this one might be best aimed at teens who have not yet started having sex. The characters can be any gender, body type, sexual orientation. I wrote it to be slightly raunchy since that will certainly appeal to and get teens attention. So after the, um, so those were our research focus groups and we did some rapid qualitative data analysis at the end of the focus groups. And as we were doing that, um, my community partners um, who were then at AIDS Foundation of Chicago, shout out to Jim Pickett and um, Elijah McKinnon, who is not at AIDS Foundation, but um, uh, works for a grassroots marketing organization called People Who Care, um, had this open call for um, LGBTQ teens in Chicago to basically do a summer think tank or um, what y'all may know as kind of these like ideating co-design type workshops. They were paid. Um, it was essentially like a summer school where they got to learn about social marketing and learn about our research and translate our research into teen-centered campaign concepts. So the research team, including myself, presented our data and then kind of let teens go with the guidance of this marketing specialist, um, drafting campaign materials, a strategy. Um, and at the end of the summer, they presented the strategy to us in the form of a creative brief. Um, blew us all away. Um, we got some, we gave them some really minor feedback. They iterated on it. And then we presented it to um, nearly 200 folks in the community. And we're like, when, you know, would you like something like this? Would you like to see something like this? What feedback do you have? So that we weren't just relying on this small group of teens and our focus group participants to like weigh in. Um, we invited these teens again um, a year later to um, kind of iterate and expand on the ideas based on feedback we had gotten from a variety of stakeholders until then. And honestly, that that what they presented to us is the blueprint for what we're doing right now. So we launched this campaign officially uh, on November 15th of last year. And um, this is sort of how we imagine the campaign flowing. So people engage with it um, through online and in-person um, uh, in person assets. So public art, um, public activations and events will be at the Youth Pride space at Chicago's Pride Fest this summer. Um, again, swag, fans, stickers, palm cards. I had pictures of them um, at the very beginning of the section. Um, social media, uh, informational website and blog, which also show you some screen grabs of um, an, an informational discord server. So similar to our youth advisory council, people wanted like a place where they could get reputable, medically accurate information, LGBTQ inclusive information about PrEP um, and also connect with other people locally. And all of this, um, our goal is, is that it's going to raise awareness, knowledge, um, empowerment, and self-efficacy on the part of teens, but also indirectly increase awareness and knowledge um, um, to the adults who support teens, um, educate teens, parent teens, et cetera. Um, we hope this will increase demand for an uptake of local, um, uh, local services for teens. And ultimately our goal is to scale prep for teens to other areas and regions in the country. 
So this is a QR code to our website. Again, I encourage you to check it out, but I took some screenshots here. Um, this was, um, the website was designed by a professional, a web designer and graphic designer, but she, we had multiple meetings with her and the teens. She saw the creative brief that the teens came up with and, you know, gave us a few directions and the teens really weighed in a lot on like what they wanted to see, whether something was sort of aligned with what their vision was. Um, these taglines were directly from the teens' creative briefs. Um, the FAQs here are things that all came out of the research and all came out of what teens wanted. Um, they wanted sort of a, um, a place where they could find um, healthcare providers that prescribed teens um, PrEP specifically. So you can go to the CDC website um, and see a PrEP locator that is for like adults. Um, um, but really there's like no way, it, there's no um, kind of drop down menu that says like sees people under 18. So we sourced this list from um, our colleagues and hope to continue growing it. Um, so um, over the course of, you know, the campaign. Um, the tips for the provider visit, you know, again, sort of came from what teenagers said they didn't know and what they wanted to know. And it also came, we also consulted with two healthcare providers who actually prescribed PrEP to adolescents in the Chicago area, John Mannheim and India Willis, and asked them, you know, what do teens come to you with questions about? What are things that you want them to know? Um, so we have tips for before, during, and after their visit. We have a blog that kind of talks about people's personal experiences, um, deciding whether to be on PrEP or not. Um, you know, the goal is not to push PrEP onto them, but really to um, have them make like an informed choice and like spread the knowledge that this exists. Because as um, one teen told us before, um, if teens know about birth control, they should also know about PrEP. Um, I've got just a few more slides here, but I just wanted to give some examples about how we engaged youth in ideating and dissemination. So um, we uh, had one of the aspects of our um, campaign was murals. The teens really wanted murals. Turns out they're like logistically complicated to place and do. Um, but so they were guided by teens vision and executed by professional artists. So what you see here are two um, in-person workshops that we had um, with uh, different groups of teens um, and the artists who did two of our murals, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and uh, the artists got both in-person like live feedback and ideas as well as asynchronous feedback via Zoom or um, you know other forms. Um, just before we launched our campaign, the day before, um, some of our team members, this is Jim Pickett, who's an HIV prevention advocate, who's kind of internationally known, David Gauna, who's one of our um, muralists, Chris Balthazar, who's the executive director of an organization on the west side of Chicago called Task Force Community and Prevention Services, and one of our youth leaders, Ryder Kennedy, who um, just graduated from Columbia College and has been with us through like the research portion of the study in 2021, um, who um, were invited to talk about their experiences um, engaging um, in this whole kind of process of prep for teens. So they were on WBEZ Reset uh, in on November 14th, if you're interested in checking that out. Um, and then here, um, one of our uh, youth leaders, Leo Martinez, and then Sadia Haidari um, were invited um, to present on a youth panel um, about their experiences in HIV prevention um, research. Um, on a worldwide webinar, which I thought was really awesome. Um, so uh, I think, you know, we have really like encouraged them to sort of um, use their experience to uh, share their to share their voice and like get more experiences like, you know, presenting and, um, you know, doing things that um, further their work and not just ours. Uh, so I mentioned we launched our campaign back in November. Um, right here is um, how uh, one of the art pieces um, was kind of, I guess, instantiated. So, so it was originally envisioned as a mural, but our um, community partners at Task Force um, are planning to move soon, and they didn't want like a permanent piece up um, that they couldn't take with them. So the artist kind of re- um, kind of imagined it as um, these like banners that hang um, on the interior windows and the exterior windows um, facing Cicero um, in the Austin neighborhood in Chicago. And these teens are teens who actually participated in um, those design workshops, which I thought was really cool. Um, our launch included like 
the unveiling of this mural, a mini ball. Um, there were like people um, kind of walking in this ball, this teen, or not even teen, I think they were like a 10 year old, like one, uh, their category in the ball, which is really awesome. Uh, and our second art piece was unveiled um, in January 2024 by another artist, Harlan Thompson. Um, you can't quite see here, but it says explore your sexual health options. It has this sort of like exploration vibe to it. And again, has our website and QR code that links to um, our resources. So um, I have talked a lot and hope to have some time to chat with you all. But I think the takeaways are is that teens are really the experts on their own lives. So um, I have really had the privilege of listening to them and kind of putting forth their perspectives and kind of just being the vehicle who gets like the research dollars or the implementation dollars to kind of um, amplify their voice. And I think that having them um, share their perspectives with us takes some of the burden off of us. We don't have to guess what they need and want all the time. Um, I've heard time and again over the last decade that meaningful engagement, um, these teens find it empowering. It gives them a say and makes them feel like adults listen to their perspectives and respect them. Um, and I think that it also, I mean, I think it, it, they've told us that it also helps us understand the research process more and foster trust in science. Um, as you've seen, we've engaged youth in a number of different ways, at different levels of involvement, um, using different ways that resonate with them. We don't use the same things all the time. Um, we gave up Facebook because they weren't on Facebook anymore and had to learn a whole new thing. That was harder on us, but better for them. Um, and with our Youth Advisory Council in particular, we try to be transparent with like what we're doing and keeping them up to date. If we make changes um, that are counter to what they wanted, we try to explain why. If we don't take their advice into account, we explain like what, you know, the kind of decision making was. Um, and I think as future taxpayers, a lot of this work is um, federally funded. They deserve to know what we're doing with their data. So, um, so we try to uh, honor that as much as possible. Um, and I think my whole thing is we don't know if we don't ask teenagers and if we don't ask we're doing teens and science science of the service. So I guess I just my call to action here is I encourage you all to um, involve teens in your research if you're an adolescent health researcher. If you always wanted to do work with teens but like kind of limited to 18 because it's like too hard to involve teens I really encourage you to try because I think um, they really deserve it and like these teens are our future is you know kind of. Um, as, as cheesy as that sounds. Um, but uh, thanks for your attention. And I, I think we have a few more minutes for questions. So thanks to all of my team. Um, there are too many people to mention here. There are thousands of adolescents who participated in my studies over the last decade, um, our funders and uh, you all for your attention. So thanks. Wow, wow, wow. That was amazing, Catherine. Thank you so much. This is the coolest thing. I've never seen these hands flying because we don't know who they're coming in from, but you're getting lots of claps and hearts and the celebratory emojis. This is just <laughs> so incredible. Um, <clears throat> I won't take up time just voicing my praise. Um, would love to then jump into the Q&A because um, this is just such a model for all of us and how we can just absolutely engage the populations we're serving in such really beautiful and impactful ways. Um, so thank you. Uh, do have a couple of questions from the group. Uh, so I'll read them out and hopefully you can also see them on your Q&A. But during the um, poll on Discord, it's easier to click the emoji that has already been selected rather than having to open the emoji list and choose a new one. I wonder if this would impact the poll results. So for those of us like me, who I'm actually learning more about this card as we speak, would love to learn about your strategy. Yeah, we actually got feedback about that exact issue um, from the teens. They said that it is easier to um, select something that people have already selected and if I want to select something that's not in the list, that is harder. So can you guys just give us the options at the bottom? And then that way, like, we can all, like, that way it doesn't sort of artificially, you know, kind of, like, like bias our responses. So we actually heard from them that they wanted that, which I thought was really cool. So we started implementing that for sure. Cool. Um, we have a, a lovely shout out from Ashley Knapp. All caps, your work is amazing, which uh, exemplifies Ashley's enthusiasm, of course, but uh, wanting to just read out loud for the rest of the, the group that there's cutting edge research with a population that has many gatekeepers, including parents, and that you and your team are doing impactful and rigorous work. Bravo. And we're excited to see what comes next. 
Um, but I'll, the last question is, what is your perspective on adoption of digital mental health technologies by community service organizations, e.g. providing mental health support in schools or via school partnerships? Um, without regulatory recognition and funding for these tools, such organizations seem reluctant to deploy digital mental health technologies, even if there is ample evidence of effectiveness. Thank you, Chris. Oh, boy, that is like, you know, the million dollar question for all of us. This is literally like what some of us, um, I remember, so... Um, I was I was a postdoc in Northwestern like over a decade ago, partly mentored by Brian Mastansky and partly men mentored by David. And um, I remember asking Brian one time, like, so what happens to these apps after after you show that they work? And there was just like crickets. <laughs> and I feel like that is kind of still I mean, it's not quite where we're at now, but we, we made some progress. But I think that that question about like implementing it in real world settings when we know that things work is like we haven't quite figured that out. I think that there are some, um, I mean, I don't wanna invite Ashley Knapp to say anything about it, but I know that she's been working with libraries to try to implement digital mental health services in the context of public libraries. So, I mean, I think there are ways to do it and and our team um, at, uh, um, at Northwestern has been doing some like type three um, implementation trials of digital interventions that have shown to be effective in community-based organizations and trying to learn from their experience, like what is getting in the way. And a lot of it is just funding. And right now the, you know, you can get funding to implement something or you can get funding to test and kind of begin to implement something from say like NIH or like um, a health department, I have some health department funding to, to implement things, but then like over time, who pays for it? And um, I think right now the CDC doesn't have a great model for funding sustainment of, of um, digital mental health or behavioral health interventions. Um, and, you know, and then there's at the same time, there's all of these like digital mental health and behavioral health apps that exist out there that are created by, um, you know, industry. And so, uh, and so, so I think that the, the sort of short answer is, is that I, I think it's, I, I would think it'd be ideal for community organizations to be able to um, play a role in like implementing and disseminating these, um, these interventions. But right now, um, I think some organizations really want to do it, but don't have the funding or capacity to do it. Some of them are threatened by it because they think it's going to take away, um, um, that, that might compete with their staff's like relevance and like stuff like that. So, uh, so I think there are a lot of questions to be answered in that space, but I, I think it's worth it. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we have a question asking if you're comfortable sharing your email address again, in case we have questions. So I'll, I can type that in. Absolutely. Uh, yes. For I, you. I think I'm the only person with my name probably like in the world. So I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, and I'll also mention um, <clears throat> that this uh, recording of this talk will be uh, posted on our CBITS website uh, in just a few days as once it's once it's live, so people can refer back to that as well. Yeah, incredible. Thank you. Anything else? More class. So as long as as long as we have a couple of minutes, I'll 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 jump in. I, the the last question, <laughs> I also resonated with. I mean the the whole the whole challenge of implementing. I mean we do a lot of work more with healthcare, but but there are just such a huge number of questions. And you mentioned, you know, funding is obviously one, and and sort of the attitudes that people in agencies might have towards 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 digital mental health. But I'm also wondering if there are sort of other other issues that you encounter, like, you know, it takes a certain amount of expertise in organizations, it, it can change workflows, it can add burden, um, you, you know, it, are there other kinds of, of issues that you've encountered in, in community, in community, working with community agencies that, that you know, assuming that they're interested that, that would, you know, yeah, absolutely. Problems. So um, we haven't published, I think we're in the process of like publishing various papers on this um, like type three uh, implementation effectiveness study of the Keep It Up intervention. So Keep It Up is a CDC like evidence-based HIV prevention intervention um, that's like on their like best evidence website. And um, the PI of that is Brian Mustansky, who's my colleague here at Northwestern. 
Um, and uh, this implementation trial compared a direct to consumer implementation of Keep It Up, um, which is for young sexual minority men, and um, compared it with CBO based implementation in like 22 different counties with like high HIV prevalence. So um, we got to explore how um, different CBOs, different levels of resources, familiarity with the population, like all of that stuff, like, like what they thought of it. And I think that there were some that were, I mean, I think one, I think the, like the idea of having a local champion who was like super excited about it and super excited about its possibility for um, engaging people in care who might not otherwise come to their services um, or um, accessing people who like lived farther away um, and not seeing it as something that competed with what they offered, but as like more of a, you know, this is just another tool in our like toolbox to reach the population that we want. I think they tended to do better. Um, and they tended to do better when they had like better marketing. So like there were some organizations that had like some social media queen who was like just like on it and like, you know, engaging in the community at like, you know, um, drag shows and stuff and like promoting it. So um, so there, there was that. And then there were some organizations that were like, this is competing with the 50,000 other things I have to do and the way that you want us to implement it in our workflow is like just not gonna happen. So, I mean, we did empower these different organizations to figure out a way that it worked for them. So I think the ones that seem to do better, I mean, this is like just based on being on the research team, but not based on like my own analyses of the data. So like TBD, this will probably be published in the next year or so. Um, but it seems like, you know, having people who were excited about it, having people who could see a way that it integrated into their services, um, you know, seeing how it could actually help them get more funding from different agencies, like that sort of thing seemed um, to be uh, like important in um, kind of predicting implementation success. So, but I mean, the money thing was just, it kept coming up over and over, like, Who's going to pay for this? This is this seems expensive. Like we're not going to maintain this website. Who is going to maintain the website? Um, that sort of thing. And prevention funding is different from like funding for you know like like prevention isn't always easy to fund through insurance mechanisms too. So that's another issue. We're at time. Thank you so much. Um, amazing talk and just really appreciate all that you shared. This was this was really terrific. Thank you, Catherine. We will see you all next month um, for Sean Munson. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Thank you.